The average life expectancy in the United States is about 79 years of age. And in the United Kingdom, it's almost 82. Around the world, Japan comes in at number one for life expectancy, with an average age of 84 years at death. Given that, 92 is rightly seen as a ripe old age, now or any time. So as remarkable as that birthday might have been in the 9th century Baghdad, imagine how much stranger it must have been to die from a tower of books falling on you in your private library during the 10th decade of your life. History tells us that this was the fate of a man known as Al-Jahiz, which means the boggle-eyed. But there's a great deal more to this story than Al-Jahiz's unfortunate nickname and his even more unfortunate death. Al-Jahiz rose from humble origins to become the literary superstar of his day. He was also the first, or among the first, to discuss ideas about evolution that would eventually make Charles Darwin a household name. Considered by many scholars to be the finest writer of Arabic prose who ever lived, this brilliant stylist wrote more than 200 books, mainly fiction, and those that have survived today are still widely read. Al-Jahiz was not only a great writer, he was also challenging to read. As a satirist, he mocked the affectations of those in upper society who held themselves as superior to the masses, and none were spared, not men of religion, nor academics or government officials, nor even the ruling class. It was a dangerous pursuit. But in this lecture, we'll get a feel for how Al-Jahiz managed to live a long and largely peaceful life. And let's begin by looking at literature in the Arabic-speaking world during this time. All too often, discussions about the Islamic Golden Age from roughly the 750s to 1258 begin and end with science. Perhaps this isn't surprising, given the many significant advances that took place during the period. But it's important not to lose sight of the advances and importance that literature also enjoyed, especially in the first century after Baghdad was founded by the Caliph al-Mansur in July 762. Now, when I speak about the Islamic Golden Age, I'm referring to a broad and not precisely demarcated historical span. Like every other somewhat artificial label applied to the past, the Dark Ages, for example, there are different opinions about when a period in question should start and end. To me, the flood of intellectual activity that took place in Baghdad and other cities of the Sunni Muslim Caliphate of the Abbasids in the 9th century marks the apogee in the development of literature and science across the 500 years of the Islamic Golden Age. Written Arabic was still a relatively recent innovation at the time. A distinct, recognizable Arabic alphabet first emerged in the first half of the 4th century AD. This written Arabic was derived from Nabataean, the language of the Nabataeans, an Arab empire whose capital was the city of Petra in modern Jordan. In turn, the Nabataean language was derived from and closely related to Aramaic, which had for centuries been the international language of trade across the entire Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean, and which is almost certainly the language spoken by Jesus. Until Arabic emerged as a written language in the first half of the 4th century AD, its literature relied exclusively on oral transmission, most obviously in the poetic tradition of recitation. All that changed with the dawn of Islam at the beginning of the 7th century. The religion of Muhammad, who lived from the year 570 to 632, had its roots 
in the urban centers of Western Arabia, between Africa and Persia, with modern Jordan and Iraq to its north. The urban and mercantile nature of the Islamic faith should not be surprising, given that Muhammad himself was a merchant from Mecca, an important trading center of its day. But this means that Islam was not, as is sometimes thought, born in the Arabian desert, where many believed the purest form of Arabic's oral poetic tradition could be found. Now, once the Islamic empire was underway and rapidly expanding at the hands of Muhammad's followers, it required written records and communications for the business of business, for governing and for every kind of legal necessity, from property deeds to tax records. The most obvious and immediate result of this was that Arabic literary output moved away from a purely oral tradition. Indeed, the word Quran, referring to Islam's sacred text, is derived from a verb which means to recite. At the same time, the Abbasid Caliphate, which was based in Baghdad and ruled most of the Middle East and wider Muslim world from 750 onwards, was fully aware that literature was one mark of a great and cultured empire, and so important to cultivate. The Islamic conquests of the 7th century included Damascus in 635, Antioch in 636, and Jerusalem in 638. These were followed by Persia after the Battle of Qadisiyah in 637. And Muslim armies continue to push outward to the Hindu Kush in modern-day India, to Kandahar and Balkh in modern-day Afghanistan, and to the frontier of Tang, China. To the south, they advanced into North Africa, including Cyrenaica in 642, Tripoli in 643, the establishment of a garrison at Kairouan, and the destruction of Carthage in 698. Consequently, while most Arab literary and cultural greatness at the time rested on the relatively recent projects of the Quran and on the Islamic religion itself, their non-Muslim subjects often came from far older and more established artistic and literary cultures. So inevitably, the Arabs and the Arabic language borrowed a great deal from the linguistic power of Aramaic, Persian and other regional tongues. During the 9th century, this would most notably have been the Persian language, with its far richer pre-Islamic literary tradition, and its closer contacts with Chinese and Indian literature. And while the nascent Arabic literary tradition clearly benefited from contact with Persian authors, it's also important to note that distinctly Arabic poetic themes and styles would later be adopted by Persian authors, including Omar Khayyam and Rumi, among others. Now, during the second half of the 8th century, the Abbasid caliphs built their new capital, Baghdad, much closer to the Persian heartland. This move led some to worry that the Arabic language like the new capital city, might be drifting too far from its Arab roots. And if that happened, they reasoned, the people might no longer be able to understand the language as it had existed in the early 7th century, when the Quran first emerged. Logically, the argument continued, if spoken Arabic moved away from the written language of the Quran, there would surely come a time when people would no longer understand the sacred text at the very heart of their religion. As a result, an official effort was organized in Basra, Baghdad, Samarra, and other Arab majority cities to formalize the Arabic language, capturing the meaning of its lexis or vocabulary and solidifying the organization of its grammar. It was into this linguistic tumult that Al-Jahiz was born, 
and which surrounded him as he grew up. Unfortunately, with regards to Al-Jahiz, as with so many characters from the period, there's not a great deal of information about his background to go on. Perhaps I should circle back and remind you that Al-Jahiz isn't his name, but rather a moniker that suggests he had bulging corneas. Thus, in English, the nickname Al-Jahiz is usually translated as boggle-eyed. We'll see where he attracted this not very flattering nickname soon. But for now, I'll note that his actual name was Abu Uthman Amr ibn Bahr al-Qinani al-Fuqaymi al-Basri. The last part of this name, al-Basri, tells us that his immediate origins were the city of Basra in the southern part of modern Iraq. Today, this port and oil production center is among Iraq's largest cities. But even in Al-Jahiz's day, it was an important center of trade and learning. And it supported a cultural life surpassed only by Baghdad and perhaps Samarra, some miles north of Baghdad. According to family tradition, one of Al-Jahiz's grandfathers was a black African slave who had been freed. And such African roots might explain why Al-Jahiz wrote at least one important treatise describing the differences between blacks and whites as he saw them. By the time he was born, of course, any slavery was in the family's past. But while they may have enjoyed liberty, they hadn't yet accomplished prosperity. And the family's financial security became more pronounced after Al-Jahiz's father died when the young son was still an infant. Al-Jahiz writes that as a boy, he sold fish along Basra's canals to help earn money to live on. Like any chore in life, one can tackle it with gusto or half-heartedly. According to his family, Al-Jahiz took the less energetic approach to selling fish. Now, in spite of his family's generally impoverished state, Al-Jahiz was proud of the fact that his mother somehow scraped together enough to send him to the local Quranic school, where he received religious instruction and learned how to read and write. And after school, he was in the habit of attending lectures by some of Basra's best scholars. Speaking as a father, I can say that where any child gets his or her interests from is often a mystery. In the case of Al-Jahiz, he quickly became fascinated with discussions of Arabic philology, or the history and development of the language, and of lexicography, or the compilation of dictionaries and other word lists, and discussions of poetry. These were subjects that would inform the rest of his long life. Al-Jahiz's mother initially bemoaned his interests in books and learning, fearing that this might lead him to become an idle dreamer. But as a young man, Al-Jahiz wrote his first treatise on the nature of the Caliphate, which we can think of as an Islamic empire, ruled over by a caliph, or the man considered Muhammad's spiritual and temporal successor. And Al-Jahiz's mother, upon recognizing his talents, supposedly handed him a tray full of notebooks and told him that he'd never again need to sell fish for the family, but rather would make his living from writing books. And how right she was. Among his approximately 200 books and treatises are fables filled with animal characters and satires parodying the rich and famous as well as a great deal of scholarly material on everything from the art of rhetoric to zoology. In addition, he wrote political and religious polemics and a number of influential works on the Arabic language, including grammar, linguistics, and etymology. With the rise of the Arabic language's new literary traditions, it wasn't long before the practice of literary criticism also developed. As in most written forms to which Al-Jahiz turned his hand, he excelled at it. 
Indeed, although only 30 of his books survive today, they show his range of interests and his skill with the pen. al jahiz moved to Baghdad in the year 816, when he was 40 years of age. Like the song New York, New York, he was right to imagine that if he could make it there, he'd make it anywhere. Word about al jahizs talent for learning and writing soon reached the ears of the caliph, al-Mamun, who was himself a young man of 30 at the time. Al-Mamun had been caliph for only three years at the time, but was developing the great center of books and learning in the Islamic Golden Age, known as the House of Wisdom, which his father, the late caliph Harun al-Rashid, had founded a few years earlier. Al-Mamun, like his father, was also driven to spend madly on translations of Greek and Persian manuscripts and in hiring the best scholars of the day. Hence, his summons to the royal court of the young and promising al jahiz The caliph was keenly interested in interviewing al jahiz about becoming personal tutor to his children, an honor and position that no scholar could refuse. Not only would it provide the seal of approval on al jahizs professional reputation, but it would also be very rewarding to him financially. Unfortunately, while al-Mamun seems to have been impressed with this learned man from Basra, his children were scared of al jahizs bulging eyes. So while al-Mamun might have been the most powerful man in Arab lands, his children were the ultimate authority when it came to hiring the royal tutor. And so al jahiz came to be stuck with his nickname, the Bogolide. Now, if he might have been personally disappointed not to get the post of tutor to the caliph's children, his professional reputation nevertheless grew stronger with each passing year earning him enormous fame and fortune. This literary renown made him the most sought after man of letters of his day. So what was it about his writing that attracted so much admiration and praise? And was it deserved? Before answering, I'm going to relate a quick anecdote that lends credence to his abiding popularity. Some years ago, I was living in the North African city of Tunis, the capital of Tunisia, and I was engaged there in a period of intensive Arabic study in advance of taking, well, actually retaking, the final exam for my master's degree. Looking for something other than Arabic grammar books to read during my spare time, I asked my Arabic tutor what writer she'd recommend for light relief. al jahiz was her immediate answer. And which title? The Book of Misers, she replied, again, without hesitation. Now, at that time, I'd never even heard of this author or the book, so I wrote down the details and said thank you. When I next went to my local bookshop, I asked if they had anything by al jahiz author of The Book of Misers. Of course, the bookseller told me, and showed me a shelf of his books. There was a wide choice including hardbacks and paperbacks. I bought a cheap paperback edition with a cartoonish illustration of two men on the cover. It was only when I got home and read the introduction that I discovered that al jahiz was a 9th century writer who had died in the year 869. Just think about that for a minute. He had died about 200 years before the Norman invasion of England. 500 years before Chaucer began writing the Canterbury Tales, 700 years before Shakespeare had even been born. Yet, not only was his the first name my teacher thought of when I asked about great Arabic language writers, but there he was in multiple editions at my local bookstore in Tunis, more than 1100 years after his death. No writer gets that degree of reputation or literary longevity without good cause. So what exactly is it about al jahiz that makes him so enduringly popular? And what are his books about? And what are they like? 
Based on the incomplete sample we have, I think that his deft command of language, his humour, his entertainment value, and his continuing relevance all offer shortcuts to thinking about Al-Jahiz and his literary style. Even a quick glance of some of the surviving titles demonstrates this. There's The Book of Misers, or another title, The Art of Keeping One's Mouth Shut, Levity and Seriousness, and finally, Against Civil Servants. In The Book of Mules, published in 868, Al-Jahiz makes fun of the seemingly endless fixation that men seem to have when it comes to penis size. He writes, If the length of the penis were a sign of honour, then the mule would surely belong to the honourable tribe of Quraysh, which of course is the tribe to which the Prophet Muhammad himself belonged. The British historian Albert Hurani, who wrote A History of the Arab Peoples and other works, once said of Al-Jahiz that his intellectual curiosity was far-reaching and his works are collections of rare and interesting knowledge concerning the human and natural world, beneath which runs a vein of moral commentary on friendship and love, envy and pride, avarice, falsity and sincerity. This point about Al-Jahiz's curiosity and breadth of interests is important because it highlights the writer's talent for what was then a fairly new literary form in Arabic and which became very popular during the early Abbasid period. This literary form is known as the compilation. Basically, it's an anthology of texts ideally dealing with a single idea or topic. These compilations were supposed to be entertaining, although they might also offer advice to their patron or the wider readership. They also allowed the compiler or editor an opportunity to show off a little by displaying how widely read he might be on a particular subject. There were no boundaries to the, what sort of subject matter a compilation would contain. And examples of the form cover everything from women to gardening and from blindness to misers. I can offer an example of what Hurani means about al jahizs curiosity and breadth of interests by quoting the following example from al jahiz himself. He wrote, A man who is noble does not pretend to be noble, any more than an eloquent man feigns eloquence. When a man exaggerates his qualities, it is because of something lacking in him. The bully gives himself airs because he is conscious of his weakness. Pride is ugly in all men. It is worse than cruelty, which is the worst kind of sins. And humility is better than clemency, which is the best of all good deeds. al Jahiz was a master of the form, as my book buying experience in Tunisia proved to me. The Book of Misers, that is, the used paperback I bought in Tunis, is a collection of 350 humorous and sometimes scandalous tales that remains popular, no doubt, because of something else I've said about al Jahiz, which is that he delights in satirizing the rich and powerful. His other most famous book is Kitab al Hayyawan, or The Book of Animals. This is a natural history text that shows the influence of earlier Greek literature, notably Aristotle's work of the same title. At the same time, al Jahiz's book of animals is highly original and is far more than a mere imitation. Indeed, drawing from any and every source he could lay his hands on, al Jahiz offers jokes, anecdotes and comments on everything animal-related including etymology, history, and anthropology. He includes selections from the Quran and pre-Islamic poetry, along with travelers' tales, popular stories, and personal observations, assimilating Arabic and non-Arabic sources. Al-Jahiz also makes more than one fascinating reference 
to his own views of evolutionary theory and natural selection. And he discusses at length the impact of the environment and climate on people, animals and plants. For instance, Al Jahiz writes that skin color depends on environmental factors. That's to say, it's the prevailing climate where one lives that determines whether a person is black or white and not the will of God. And with regards to evolution in the animal kingdom, he offers the following observation. Animals engage in a struggle for existence, for resources, to avoid being eaten and to breed. Environmental factors influence organisms to develop new characteristics to ensure survival, thus transforming into new species. Animals that survive to breed can pass on their successful characteristics to offspring. Now, this sounds strikingly modern to my ears, even if it was written centuries before Darwin published on the origin of species in 1859. Al Jahiz, like all public figures of his day, was also involved in discussion about religion, primarily Islam, which was still developing in certain significant respects during the 8th and 9th centuries. Like his first royal patron, the Caliph al Mamun, Al Jahiz was a supporter of the now defunct Mutazilite school of Islamic theology. With its origins in Al Jahiz's hometown of Basra, Mutazilite followers advocated a philosophically rationalist approach to religion arguing for a greater reliance on reason in matters of theology. Mutazilites also believed in the created as opposed to the eternal nature of the Quran, arguing that if the Quran is the word of God, then logically God must have preceded his words. The opposite opinion, which argued that the Quran is the uncreated or eternal word of God, won out over time, and modern Islamic orthodoxy believes that the Quran is uncreated and eternal. Some critics, including certain contemporary terrorist groups, denounce the Mutazilite as apostate for their stance vis-à-vis -vis the Quran, i.e. that it was created rather than an uncreated text. But in their own day, the Mutazilite were essentially an orthodox group. Al Jahiz remained committed to their cause and wrote in favor of it, apparently without repercussion, even after one of Caliph al Mamun's successors later abandoned the school. So, in the end, Al Jahiz's contemporaries were able to look beyond his bulging eyes. And this wonderful writer, whose words spoke of and to higher powers, would even have a crater named after him on the planet Mercury. And Mercury, I'll have you know, is not only the messenger to the gods in classical mythology, but also the god of luck. In closing, I offer an observation by Al Jahiz himself that is sure to resound with book lovers around the world. Al Jahiz wrote, the book is silent when you need silence and eloquent when you want it to talk. It never interrupts you if you are busy, but if you feel lonely, it will be a good companion. It is a friend who never deceives or flatters you, and it is a companion who never grows tired of you. <laughs>